Welcome back to our series on how to play the real book, where we talk about different interpretations of the lead sheets found in the real book. Today, what we're actually going to do is dive into the Christmas real book with Auld Lang Syne. Go ahead and check out some of the other videos if you haven't done so already, because we talk about some basic prerequisite concepts there that are going to help you understand sort of what we're doing today. Why don't we take a listen to a few bars of the arrangements and don't forget to stick around to the end of the video where we'll show you how to have access to a PDF of today's arrangement. Uh, we'll listen to a few bars and then talk about the things that we did to today's Auld Lang Syne. So at the top here, you see sort of a, a starting point uh, that we're starting from before we enact our enhancement. So basically, this is where our, our default perspective is. We use uh, just the chords and the melody that are written on the page, mostly root position, closed voicings, and, and inversions, and we define the grid at the quarter note level. So that's kind of our starting point from which we pepper in all the enhancements down here, one through 13. So why don't we listen to the first four bars and uh, talk about what pops up in those first four bars as it relates to these enhancements. All right, so right off the bat, you see basic root position chords used right here, this F6 and this this D minor seven, we've added the seven here. Um, and the next measure, you start to see the implementation of some basic inversions. This third inversion, G minor seven, uh, this second inversion, C seven over here. This creates, like we've talked about before, really nice, smooth voice leading, which is always favorable when you're sort of picking what voicing to use. We talked about this recently. Think about where you are and where you wanna go, all right? Uh, over here in measure three, we have some broken chords that create these passing tones uh, down here. At the end, the fourth beat of this measure here, we have uh, a voicing that has just the root of the chord and the guide tones. The guide tones being the third and seventh of the chord. So you have this D sharp and this A represent those guide tones and then the root down here. Right before this, this chord voicing on, on beat four, it kind of glossed over this, there's a rootless voicing on the third beat, this F7, just E flat, uh, A and C. So the, the root is, is omitted. And we've talked about the implementation of rootless voicings as a means of, uh, well, if you're playing with a bass player, giving them some like freedom to do what they wanna do, or in the context that we're using in here, just creating a really cool um, sort of color and this ambiguous sort of feeling that you get from a rootless voicing. So definitely, lean into your rootless voicings from time to time. We have a whole course on how to play rootless voicings and how to implement them. So check that out if you're interested to learn more. I love, I love rootless voicings. I guess continuing to work backward here in this measure, if I go back to beat one, I also glossed over the fact that what we had originally was an F6 is now an F major seven. And this actually really helps create this line that we wanted down here, this F stepping down to E uh, to the seventh of our F7 chord here on uh, beat three is kind of a, a, a driving factor of why we decided to sort of reharm the F6 into an F major seven. Now, for the most part, these F major sevens or these major seven chords and their six counterparts are, are more or less interchangeable so long as the melody is not the root of the chord here. And if you look here, you see that that's, that's why the F6 in the original arrangement works so well because the melody is the root of the chord. When you have the major seven butted up against the root of the chord, you get a you get a minor second, very dissonant. So that's why the original arrangement had an F6, but in our case that we're creating this line, the major seven actually works uh, really well because that tension is immediately resolved on the second and ensuing beats of the measure. So know that these six and major seven chords are more or less interchangeable. You can kind of like swap them out as you want to, but definitely consider the melody we're always talking about considering the melody when you decide to reharm stuff. So that's basically the rule here as it relates to whether or not you wanna turn a six chord into a major seven. Make sure the melody is not on the one if you wanna do that. All right, so with our newfound understanding and knowledge of what's happening, let's take a listen again 
to those first four bars, and I'll let it play into the next four bar phrase too, so that we can break that down afterwards. So let's see what's going on here uh, in this pickup note that leads into measure five. Well, one thing we've done right off the bat, and you can kind of see the chords highlighted in red in our arrangement represent alterations or reharms or changes from the original arrangement, which again is up here in this top line if you want to kind of compare and contrast in real time what's happening. So what we had originally was this four chord going to the sharp four diminished to the one six four really common sort of gospel sound and wasn't really feeling that gospel vibe here so what we just did was just change this b diminished seven to a b minor seven flat five kind of breaking up that sound a little bit um, this is something you can kind of always do to the sharp four diminished if you don't like that that gospel sound feel free to just go with a minor seven flat five you'll also see on that uh, chord the way we're voicing it is just the root and one of the guide tones with the flat five present to sort of, you know, hammer home that reharm that we just did. On the downbeat of measure five, we merely just took the major seven voicing, and turned it into a triad. Don't forget about the triads, guys. Like triads are really great chords. There's something uh, really simple about them, and in, in the right instance, in the right mood, in the right context, they're actually sometimes your best choice. You don't need to complicate some of this harmony sometimes. So what we've done here is uh, just taken this F major seven over C, got rid of the major seven, kind of opened it up a little bit, let it breathe a little bit more, and I kind of really like the sound. You're gonna see that again over here. Let's fast forward. Uh, what measure is this? Measure seven, on the down beat of measure seven. We did the same thing, the D minor seven. It's just a D minor triad now. So feel free to simplify stuff from time to time too, because that really, really works as much as some of these sort of esoteric and complicated things that we're doing. Uh, work, so do, so do triads. Looking here at measure six, we see uh, another inversion, uh, creating nice voice leading in our left hand, a third inversion of G minor seven. On the third beat, a rootless voicing again of C seven. Uh, so yeah, E, uh, B flat, D, and G. We've introduced tension nine here too. Tension nine is a really useful uh, tension to introduce pretty safely on almost any chord in any key uh, with any function. So that's what we've done here for the most part. Here on the third beat of measure seven, we just have a, a G minor seven with just the root and, and one guide tone. Uh, the D is, is in the melody though, so I guess you could kind of see the fifth being present. But as it relates to the left hand, yeah, just the root and one guide tone. On beat four, we simplify things a lot. Uh, it says C7, but all we have is the bass note of the chord and that works really nicely and again, speaking to that sometimes less is more mentality when you're playing these arrangements. Another thing you might have noticed that we did on this last chord here is sort of simplify it in a way, right? Like it says C7 sharp five in the original arrangement. We've just omitted that sharp five. So when we look at measure nine, we see this nice open voicing. So root, fifth, third, being basically broken apart on the first two beats. These open voicings are great on the left hand because they basically work wherever you want them to without having to worry about that lower octave limit that we're always talking about. Remember, certain intervals are not available to you when you go low enough on the piano, but octaves and fifths, they're always good to go. And that's kind of what this voicing is based on. Fast forwarding over to measure 11, you, we start to sort of hint at changing the grid from the quarter note default setting that we talked about in the beginning to more of an eighth note grid. You're gonna see it really take effect later on, but we're starting to sort of intimate that right now, uh, that the grid is shifting from quarter notes to eighth notes. You'll see it be, again, more clearly defined later, but this is sort of the first instance of that beginning to happen. On the fourth measure, I'm sorry, the fourth beat of this measure, we see that uh, we had a B7 flat nine sharp five, 
and we're going to implement our first use of an upper structure triad, an A flat over B7. What this upper structure triad does, well, it does a couple things, but one of the things it does is give us a B7 with a flat nine and a natural 13. And like all upper structures, it kind of really gives us this really cool color that you don't get otherwise, this sort of separate entity on the right hand uh, that exists highlighting certain notes in the chord. And we have, again, we have a whole course on upper structure triads, upper structure chordals. If you want to better understand how to implement those, uh, check that out. Uh, the phrase just merely ends with a B flat major seven. And then again, we have the, the beginnings of that four sharp four, one six four gospel uh, sound about to occur here, but we've changed the B diminished seven into a B minor seven flat five yet again, and you're seeing more eighth notes. Let's go ahead and listen to the phrase we just broke down, and then I'll let it play again into the next four bars so we can talk about what's going on there as well. So you're already kind of seeing what we talked about right here in measure 13. We kind of got rid of that sharp four passing diminished chord and replaced it for a minor seven flat five. And then like we did before, we just turned this F major seven over C into a triad, an F over C. Measure 14, you see our first implementation of a grace note uh, here on the right hand, as well as uh, taking this two five and, and turning it into a five of five to five, sort of in the spirit of an extended dominant sequence, but we're only kind of doing it with one chord. So this two of five, I'm sorry, this two to five is now just a five of five to five uh, in measure 14. And at the end of our phrase here, you definitely start to see the eighth note grid come into full swing here. So let's take a listen to that phrase one more time. Uh, not a lot going on here, so it should be easy to sort of digest and understand and then we'll uh, let it play into the next four bar phrase. So like we said before, our eighth note grid becoming really defined here. Uh, not much going on in measure 17 that you can't find in the original arrangement other than that, uh, that eighth note grid being there. Here in measure 18, we have that five of five. Uh, we swapped out the two chord for the five of five again. There's another grace note down there also on the right hand. Here on the fourth beat, uh, we have an altered tension. So you can always take a tension, a 9, 11, or a 13, and, and make it altered. It, that's a one-way street, right? So if you have, what I mean to say is if you have a flat 9, don't make it a natural 9. If you have a sharp 9, don't make it a natural 9. Uh, but if you have a natural 9, or a natural 9 is implied in the chord chord scale pairing, then yeah, you can go ahead and alter it, which is really good to do on five chords, because, I mean, five chords are all about tension. So altering those uh, extensions is a great way to get that tension. Right here in measure 21, we see our first uh, instance of melodic uh, reinterpretation. The, the D that was in the original melody is now an F. On the third and fourth beat of the same measure, 
we kind of see a rhythmic variation where the two, what were two quarter notes, are now referencing the rhythm that were in the first half of the measure that also, by the way, uh, carries into uh, the beginning of the next measure, this quarter note, eighth note rhythm. Down here, uh, we see a lot of these layers effect that we talked about in other videos where you're kind of seeing the piano as almost a drum set and having the different components of what you're playing on the keyboard represent different layers of the drum set, the kick, the snare, the crash, uh, the toms and all that stuff. So this creates, again, a lot more complexity rhythmically and further defines our eighth note grid that we were talking about a lot earlier. Fast forwarding here, again, we've gotten rid of the, the sharp five on that C7 sharp five for the reasons that we mentioned earlier. Here we have more of a melodic variation, right? So that A that was originally in the melody, we've turned to an F. And you'll notice in a lot of these melodic variations, uh, our safe bet here is just using other chord tones present in the chord. It's not a must do, but you can't really go wrong if you're gonna change the melody to another note that's already in the chord. In the next measure, you see another rhythmic variation, that G and that F, the first two melodic notes of the measure have now kind of been compressed and displaced later into the measure by way of this dotted quarter note, uh, 16th note rhythm here. Here's more of the stuff we've already talked about, uh, that eighth note grid down there. We're not really changing any of the chords from the original, we're keeping the, the melody true to form here. Uh, more of the same here in measure 28. Measure 29, the F major seven over C is yet again a triad F over C uh, to this D minor seven, just a regular root position voicing down here. Um, here again, this five of five, we've taken the two chord G minor seven and swapped it out for the five of five G seven here. So everything's kind of culminating here on this last line uh, with a couple of techniques. So you definitely see the eighth note grid uh, showing up pretty heavily here, especially on these last few bars. But there's a lot of open voicings being used here. And a really cool thing uh, happening here in measure 32 is a sort of reinterpretation of the pedal point. So if you look at the original harmony with A flat six over F, G flat major seven over F to F. So that pedal point is, is in the bass. We've taken that pedal point and put it elsewhere in the voicing. So you won't see it in the bass here, but you will find it in the melody, it is, it's, a, it's our melody note, and we have it in the voicings of our A flat six and our G flat major seven. You can clearly see it as, as an octave here on the A flat six, and then in another harmonic octave, just an octave higher here in the G flat major seven. So there's our reinterpretation of the pedal point. We still have our pedal point. We just took it out of the bass and put it in the uh, right hand voicings of the chord, and to make it kind of more strong, we made them octaves themselves. And these last two bars, we just have a nice arpeggiation of our F6 chord culminating on an F major seven using the eighth notes that we talked about. You see tension nine show up here. There's a G, uh, that useful tension that we talked about earlier, always a safe bet. And uh, yeah, like we said at the, at the very end here, we're culminating on an F major seven by way of this note here, E.
Thanks again for joining us today on our How to Play the Real Book uh, Christmas edition. All of our members will have access to today's PDF. If you'd like to become a member, go ahead and click on the join button or the link down below. Check out our website, mdex.com, for all sorts of useful music information resources. YouTube seems to think you're gonna like one of these two videos here, so definitely stick around and check one of those out. Thanks for watching.